All right. Um, if you're just joining us uh, for the first time, we're actually uh, continuing a teaching series we've been doing for about a month and a half now called Onward, which is connected to a book by Dr. Russell Moore called Onward. We're super creative with the titles around here. Um, and and in, in this book, we're, we're considering what does it mean for our church not just to gather on Sundays and feel good about ourselves because we got a lot of Christians in a room, okay? That's not why I moved here. That's not why we're sending Justin and Jessica to Providence. We're actually here because we want to take the gospel of this kingdom out from our mouths, out from our lives, and out from this place into the world that really, really needs it. But when you do that, then you bump into some problems. One of those problems being our own personal fear. Uh, the other problem being perhaps uh, the world saying, I don't really like your message. And a third problem being, you know, our, our consideration of, well, if they don't like our message, maybe they won't like me. And, and how, do we, how do we take this timeless gospel of the kingdom into a place that doesn't feel like it needs it, and when we say it, sometimes very virulently expresses that they do not want it? How do we engage culture without letting go of the gospel. History is littered with lots and lots of attempts at cultural engagement, which, which overcorrect. Either they want to be so relevant that they become irrelevant to God, or that they want to be so faithful that they don't actually take the gospel anywhere because they're just sitting here protecting it, making sure no one changes it. We don't want to be that way. We want to engage the culture, and we don't want to let go of the gospel. And so, uh, in the first week, we considered how, if we're going to do that, first we have to see everything framed by the kingdom of God, okay? We can't just take issues and sort of extract them from the Bible as if they're not part of a larger story or not part of a larger framework, because they are. And so, today, we're going to be considering one of the many topics we've been considering, which is family, particularly family stability. But I want you to understand that as we're talking about this today, we're not coming at this from like liberal political point of view or conservative political point of view because those things aren't solid. They're constantly moving and they're certainly not eternal. Rather, if we're going to think about family, we need to do so from a kingdom perspective. And that's what we're going to attempt to be doing today. And so, uh, in order to help us with that, we're going to be looking at two passages of the Scriptures that are connected to why God made family in the first place, first from the book of Genesis, and second from the lips of our Lord Jesus. So, let's go uh, to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and when he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up the place with flesh, and that rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to him. And then he said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, for she was taken from man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked but we're not ashamed. Fast forwarding to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, the third verse, Jesus was confronted about this teaching and what it meant for uh, the common practice of divorce at the time. And he said this, the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful for, uh, to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered them, have you not read? That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What, therefore, God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. This super unpopular teaching is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, um, clearly we need help. Um, Send the Holy Spirit into the room. Some of us, as soon as I said the word family, just started to emotionally and intellectually check out. I pray you'd keep that from happening. Some of us come from really broken families. Um, Some of us are aiming at a picture of family. Some of us idolize family. Father, wherever we are on the map, would you help us to see that family is a creation created by the king to reflect the nature of the kingdom, and only the gospel of the kingdom can restore a vision of family. 
Help us, God. Amen. So, I have this room in my house that, uh, that I never use for its purpose. It's there because I think I live in an old house and it's very traditional uh, in its construction, and this is my dining room. Uh, I don't know if you have a dining room in your house, but very rarely do we find ourselves actually dining in this room. Um, it says dining room. I have a dining room table. I own china. Why? I don't know. Why? Um, right? Like, the, these are all the things that you get when you get married, and I have silverware made of, like, silver. I know. Uh, but, but we don't use it because it only is to be used in the dining room, and we don't ever eat in the dining room. And it kind of makes you beg the question, like, why do we have this room again? Like, how, I mean, aside, I would wall it in and use it for something else, except I got to pass through it to get to my kitchen. And, uh, and those of you who know me know that I like food, and there shall be no wall between me and my food. So, how, like, why, why do we have this traditional thing called the dining room that seems to harken back to a really old time, you know, when we would come to dinner parties all, you know, dressed up in coat and tie and be announced, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Adam Abray. And, uh, uh, but I don't own a castle, and I have a table in my kitchen, so why do I have a dining room? I think many of us, when we think about family, treat it the way I treat my dining room. Like it's here, and we know it used to have a function, and I have stuff that's supposed to go in that room, and I don't really use it, and I'm not really sure that I want it, and I kind of want to repurpose it. But family isn't a dining room. (laughs) Family is created by God, the King, to tell us something about the nature of His kingdom, And only the gospel can really renew our vision of the family. So, we show up to the idea then of family, kind of every one of us has, as my grandpa likes to say, a dog in that hunt. Like every one of us is invested in the concept of family because every one of us either came from a family or is in a family or wants to make a family. I realize most of you in this service are single, so you don't really think of your families, but I assure you, you did not hatch, okay? Uh, You did not kind of wake up and like, oh, it huh, I probably ought to go to school and then just go, okay? You just kind of into the world. Uh, someone, someone made you, right? Uh, someone delivered you and brought you into the world. You have a family. Now, for m- many of you in the room, you're like, that's great news. I love my mom. I love my dad. I love my brothers and sisters, and that's great. And then for some of you, that's not the case. For some of you, family reunions look like those Hallmark cards. You know, dad's wearing a sweater vest, and he's carving a turkey as he lovingly looks on to his children who are waiting there patiently admiring their father. (laughs) That's never how meals go in my family. Um, (laughs) My children are usually ready to eat me, and um, I don't own a sweater vest. So, those are the reasons. Some of you, however, you know, your family gatherings involve a little bit more law enforcement than that picture, right? And so, my... uh, I don't want you to come and approach the topic of family merely from your own perspective today. What I'm going to ask you to do is, is is help me by trying to just for a minute uh, disassociate from whatever good or negative experience you come from, and let's try to just reimagine what it would mean if the Scriptures are true, that God made this thing called family, and that He made this thing called family, therefore, to reflect something about Him, and how, in a really broken world, are we going to get back to that? Because I assure you, the dining room has a purpose. It has a great purpose. But some of us don't think so. We, We come... And, you know, for those of us who are married and trying to do family, we know family's kind of hard, right? It, it, it takes effort. There are times when I'm a jerk or when they're jerks or when she's a jerk or we're all being jerks together, right? And then uh, we're also all being sanctified as we follow Jesus together. And that sometimes just uh, takes a minute. And so some of us need help. And then we're trying to raise children and pay bills and do all of these things. Family can be hard. And so some of us are like, well, family's so hard. Maybe you don't want to do it. I know lots of married people and none of them are happy. So maybe I shouldn't. Or, or maybe you say, well, you know, I love this person. Why do I need a piece of paper to say that I love this person? And, and biblically, you don't need a piece of paper. Massachusetts requires you to have one. You do need a covenant, which isn't the same. Some of you, uh, you know, you're, you're thinking, well, maybe marriage isn't really necessary. You know, many of you, you've got the, uh, you're in the cultural milieu where progressive sensibilities sort of take charge of sort of everything. And so maybe you're looking at family and you're like, you know, this was great for some bygone era, but maybe now we need to remodel the dining room. Maybe now family is, you know, maybe instead family should just be, you know, close relationships of mutual beneficence uh, in whatever, with no relation to gender or number or really anything, and we have family is kind of whatever you make it you want it to be, and as long as it achieves 
something that we're not really quite sure of. We feel like that's maybe progress. So we'll call it progressive. And, and I get that. I, I get that because family is hard. And, and if you're like me, your family reunions didn't involve dad and a sweater vest and smiles. It, they, if my whole family got together, we would have to call the cops. <laughs> um, funny because it's true. <laughs> so, so what do we do? Well, then if, if that's the case, then we're sort of presented with two options. Option number one is to take the concept of family and just kind of re- retool it and go, well, the traditional family is... Uh, not working anymore, and so let's just go down the road of kind of remaking it, and um, just, I don't want to spoil the rest of our time together, but that's not what we're going to do, um, because uh, cause God made this thing called family, and it's not, a, therefore, a, a, a human construct. Now, I can hear many of you going, well, but my professor says that it is. Okay, well, your professor is wrong. Did you know that that's possible? <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. Um, I, I am sure. While it is true that, that socially every culture adds some stuff to family, traditions, concepts, dress, food, where you eat, when you eat, how big your home should be, what kind of home you live in, who, where, these, these are all true things. But this thing called family, the husband and wife and mom and a dad and like that, that thing, that basic unit of society is not a thing that we've just made up. It's created by God, and if it's created by God, it's created for some good. So we're not going to pursue the road of just retooling family, though I very much understand why many wish to, because for the last forever, it's been really hard. Family's really hard. And then we don't do them right, and they seem riddled with sin, and then you get generational stuff, and then I've got my own ideas and the things I want to be when I grow up, and I don't know if I necessarily want to, you know, hitch my wagon to some person for the rest of my days. Like, I I get that, because I'm, I'm human. And I mean, perhaps for too long in the church, we've, you know, elevated this thing called family that as soon as you get one of these, man, it is the business. <laughs> it's just great. All the time. You wake up, pipe and slippers. I don't even smoke a pipe, but I have one now because I'm a dad. Uh, you know, and I'm just whisked downstairs by my good thoughts when my breakfast is waiting for me and my children look like blah, blah, blah. That's, that's, not, that's not it. Because for so long, the church has maybe overcorrected and fought for this thing called traditional family. We've been trying to take culture and bring it back to like a a vision of the family that was from like the 1950s or something. And that's not necessarily A, biblical, or B, a good enough reason to hang on to this dining room that we're not really sure we need in our house anymore. We need something a little bit deeper, a little bit older, and far more cosmic than that. And, And we have it. And the creation of the world and, and why God would make it. See, family was created by God to tell us something about God, but only the gospel of the kingdom of God can really renew our vision in that thing. So I want to take that sentence and, and break it into three parts. Family is created by God. Family is a creation, not a construct. And, and we know that, and, and I, I hear this all the time, well, we're not really sure what Genesis 1 is, Pastor. Maybe it's poetry. And if it's poetry, maybe we don't have to obey it because I'm sure God would put poems in the Bible that we don't actually have to read or obey. Well, The hard part about that is that Jesus repeats it (laughs) very clearly in the exact same words. Darn it. And so, because uh, this is not the only time that family has felt, uh, you know, under attack. And of course, I I get that in in the media, we want you to believe family is under attack only very recently. But I have news for you. Family came under attack like eight or nine minutes after the world was made. So the attack's been a lot older and has been going on a lot longer. And it has very little to do with our current politics. It just inhabits them. God created the world, and one of the first things that he made after he made human was to realize, oh, I need another one of these. But as if to stress the point, God paraded all the other critters in front of Adam uh, and to name them. And Adam is like, giraffe, rhinoceros, ape, dog, and he's just going through them. And thank God, not among them was a helper fit for him, right? As a married man, I'm very glad that, you know, I'm betrothed, as it were, to a, a female and not to a rhinoceros. Um, you know, call it preference. Um, uh, so, so among them was not a helper fit for him. And so God simultaneously invents anesthesia and surgery to bring about this human who's like Adam, but not, but is, but isn't. And from him... He makes them so that them can be one. 
So family, one of the reasons that family was made is to help us understand that we were made by a God who is both a society and a unity so that in our marriages we might be both a society and a unity. Think of this. God eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet he is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's a very important Hebrew word, echad. Okay? Then God goes about making folks, and he makes a dude, and he's like, it is not good for single dudes to be the thing, which if you know a bunch of them, it's true, um, right? And so, that's a strong amen. It's a strong amen. Yes. Yes. Probably have an altar call right now after that one. That's, that's good. <laughs> we're like, I don't know why we're planting churches. We need to plant dating ministries. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, so, from one God creates two so that the two can become one, just as God is both one and many. From the society and unity of the Trinity, God creates this thing called family to be a society and unity. And so it, it's, a, it's created by God, and it has some purpose to it. Family was designed by God to involve this, this woman and this man coming together in this way that is radically one in such a way where God would say in his word, it is for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one. And that word, that word one, echad, is the same word that God uses to describe his own self later on in the very same book, which is meant to tell us something. Family is designed to be a picture of the oneness and society of the Trinity. It's meant to tell a story. It's created by God to reflect something about God into the world, the unity and diversity. It's also meant to be uh, radically committed in this thing called covenant, not a mere association of individuals on the basis of mutual beneficence. I don't, I'm not married to my wife because she makes me feel nice, because as soon as she stops making me feel nice, then I can get to be unmarried to her. That is the modern popular view of marriage, and if indeed that is the only reason one would get married, I don't know why you would. Because if marriage is just an arrangement where you make me feel nice, so let's live close to one another to make that more convenient. Like, all right. But that's not the reason marriage was made. The reason marriage was created was to reflect the oneness and in, in, uh, society of God. It was also created to reflect God's radical covenant commitment. That I'm making this commitment to my wife not to love her when she makes me feel nice, but to love her with a never-stopping, never-ending, always-and-forever faithful kind of love, which is the kind of love with which God loves us. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty glad God doesn't divorce me when I make him upset because I would give him cause for going to court about every day. And you would too. (gasps) Me? Yes. Yes. And if you feel like maybe you're a better person than that, just ask your friend or ask your spouse. (laughs) They'll help alleviate you of that bad idea. Family is created by the king to tell us something about him. So therefore, it's also meant to tell us something about about what a human being is, that that humans were made in this cool arrangement. And and so, like, gender is a good thing that's created by God. I, I realize that it's cool for your professors to say and for the New York Times to write that, like, gender is between your ears and sex is between your legs. Um, that's not true from the beginning. That, that's, that's a part of what our culture says that we lovingly listen to and we lovingly fall out of agreement with. Now, I realize to disagree with that is to be a bigot. Oh, you don't agree with me. If you're called a bigot, because you don't agree with someone, then all of you are bigots. Because at some level, you don't agree with somebody about something. The person I love most in the world, my wife, we disagree all the time. And I can assure you, I'm not bigoted against her. You, you can actually hold varying views and still love someone very deeply. The scriptures say very clearly that God, in creating embodied gender, created a good thing. Now, I realize that in our current moment, and uh, maybe many of you listening to me right now, you're going, well, I, I've struggled with my gender identity. I, I, I don't in any way mean to diminish your experience. But before we can really address that, we must first look at the first two chapters of Genesis to see, well, what was it like in the beginning? What was it like in the beginning? In the beginning, we see that children are a blessing, because that's basically how they're treated here, right? Children are a blessing. <laughs> that, that explains why when, uh, when I took my children a Whole Foods, after moving here a couple of months later, I had a woman walk up to me and say, don't you know the planet's overpopulated? 
And I was like, oh, God, you're real. That's awesome. Uh, and then I was like, well, I took your spot then. <laughs> so you should probably move on. Um, that's not necessarily what I should have said, but it's important that you know your pastor's human. Um, and, and we've made humans, uh, and we celebrate that. In the last service, we just dedicated our children because the scriptures say that children are a blessing. They're a blessing. Kids are a blessing. We have Alethea kids. We train our children, but not because, you know, they're annoying little critters that we want to get out so that the grown-ups can talk about the big stuff. We have created an entire ministry to teach them the gospel so that they might grow in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and grow into be great young men and women of God. We care a lot about that. We invest a lot of money in that. It's like our largest ministry team and the one that requires the most commitment because we care. Well, it's because family is created by God to tell us something about God and the way that he is. Family is for the kingdom, therefore. Family, family is, has a purpose, not just for your self-expression. And this is the one I think that we modern people struggle with the most, that, oh, I feel this way and am attracted this way and built this way, and so I need to rearrange family to meet my needs because the highest goal of human existence and the good life that we're all after is self-expression. And so I can't fully be myself until I fully express all of everything about myself from myself into the world. And I, do you realize how historically crazy that idea of human fulfillment is? For literally the entire history of our species, except for like the last 80 to 100 years, we have always thought that freedom was not freedom to do whatever the heck you want to do and be whatever the heck you want to be. Freedom, rather, was having your will and your moral center so unshackled that you could live the virtuous good life. That's a whole lot different kind of freedom than many of us are after. Most of us, we want to achieve financial independence and sexual independence and moral independence and political independence. We want to be individuals and we want to dress how we want. I want to wear a hat and carry a jellyfish and smoke a cigarette because I'm an individual. Like, it's ridiculous. There are seven billion of you. We can't all be unique, all right, my little snowflakes? We just can't, all right? Like, we're going to do some things in common. We're all going to wear pants. We're all going to wear pants, okay? Like... <laughs> We're all going to do it. We're all going we're all going to eat some food, all right? And we're all around here it's always going to have kale in it. Like there are some ways that we're all going to, right? We're all going to drive cars and then feel bad about it. Okay? We're going to do things. There are some things that make us human together. And what ruins family therefore and what what part of what makes it so hard is not just that family stinks, it's that it's kind of that we do. Many of you, you come from broken families and you're, you're wondering, why would I want to commit my life to a man or woman as their husband or wife forever? Well, let me give you the reason why that's so hard. In, in the beginning, after this first beautiful marriage ceremony that God presided over, I know all of you are planning you know, your wedding and you're like, oh, it'll be like this, it'll be like this. Can I tell you, the first one was better than yours. It was in Eden, cool venue, all right? right? And God was the officiant better than me, okay? Just great. And, um, and it was awesome. And then our first mother was tempted. First mother was tempted not to live the virtuous life and to be free to do everything God had commanded, but rather was tempted by a false king in the form of a serpent who said, you know what real freedom is? Doing whatever you want. So you read the text in Genesis 3, it says that she looked with her own eyes and saw that the fruit was desired to make one wise. And she decided that it would be good for food. And she, and all of a sudden, the locus of human freedom wasn't any longer on what God said we should be and, and freeing us to be everything that he has asked us to be, but rather doing what we want to do. You do you, honey, was the devil's cry. And the headline tomorrow was, two people follow their hearts, billions dead. Because that's what happened. She took, she disobeyed God. She became autonomous and she ex decided to express herself over and against what God had promised would be good in the world. And what happened was a broken relationship with God, which we talk about all the time as a result of sin, and a broken relationship with her husband though. Because they, when they hid, when God said, where are you? And they hid, they didn't just hide from God, they hid from each other. 
It was just totally what sin does. All of a sudden, they're ashamed of their bodies. They're ashamed of the covenant that they made. They're ashamed of what God has called them into because maybe me and my vision of beauty and goodness in the world is different than you and your vision of beauty and goodness in the world. And maybe now all of a sudden, I'm not good enough for you. And maybe now all of a sudden, you're not going to be good enough for me. And now I really don't know when the reason we don't know isn't because we're all just trying to figure out what it means to be individuals. The reason that we really don't know is because we refuse to do what God has said and trust him with what we are. Family is this thing that's been made by God to tell us something about the kingdom. And it breaks down because of sin. But from the beginning, this was not so. This is why Jesus was asked about divorce. Well, uh, is it okay for a man and a woman to be divorced as long as he gives her a note? You know, 12-point font, Times New Roman, double-spaced, properly cited, signed. And Jesus' answer, I love Jesus' answer. It's one of the reasons I think Jesus is a little bit sarcastic, which makes me feel good. Because he says, have you read your Bible? Which is hilarious, because he's talking to people with, like, PhDs in religion. (laughs) And he's like, didn't you read your Bible, like, on the first page? Like, when God made everything and made them to be one? Like, he's one? Remember that part? And they're like, yeah, yeah, but Moses said, you know, a man could divorce his wife if he gives her a certificate. And that's true. The, the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy, it says that a man may divorce his wife if, uh, if, if he gives her this certificate. But when you read the law, the, the scriptures, it's very obvious that this is not because she burnt the dinner, which is actually what some Jewish scholars uh, in the intertestamental period said. was well, If in any way she displeases him, it's over. But that's not what the scriptures say. Obviously, built into the text is the case of marital infidelity, which is why Jesus says, therefore, divorce is like no bueno unless one of you has broken the covenant by being sexually unfaithful to your partner. Jesus says, I, God hates divorce. That's not what it is. You were made from oneness for oneness in marriage. And marriage is this cool thing that's meant to reflect something about God into the world and therefore is worthy of protection and worthy of teaching and worthy of prayer and commitment And it's typically right here at a point in the message like this that you, many of you go, oh, well, I feel bad. Because we talked about how marriage is created by God and and how marriage reflects the kingdom of God and and reflects what it means to be a man or be a woman or to be a husband or to be a wife. It creates a safe boundary zone for uh, raising children in every sociological survey up into the present. Shows this. We know this. But we work really hard as a society to unknow this because marriage is so dab-lame difficult and it has so many implications that we're not sure that we want to live with that we don't have much hope for it. And men and women, I have to tell you, I have no hope for marriage either outside of the gospel. I love my wife. Sometimes being married to me, I know this you might find this hard to believe, can be challenging, right? Sometimes being married to her can be challenging. And these four beautiful humans we've made can be really challenging. And so very often, of course, we feel tempted sometimes just to be like, you know what, I, I want to go. Of course. But we don't. Because marriage is about something bigger than me. Family is about something bigger than me. And it's about something bigger than you. It's about God and the story of God and the kingdom of God. But the only thing that can give you hope for marriage and the hope for family is the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom gives you hope for marriage first if you, are, um, if you are single, what? Many of you single people were like, he's talking about marriage. I'm going to tweet, right? And uh, I'll just come back up for the song. I'll come back up for the song. Um, but the gospel actually, the gospel of the kingdom is what gives you hope for family, even if you're single. And, and here's why. In Matthew 19, Jesus says this, I tell you that anyone who divorces wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits to adultery. But he goes on. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Of course, they love the gusto of young, like, 17-year-old men. Yes, we'll be faithful and committed, but they totally haven't thought about it. Um, <laughs> and he says, uh, well, not everyone is going to be able to accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others are eunuchs because they were made that way by men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. And so the question becomes, well, what in all of the world is a eunuch? And so uh, eunuchs were um, usually uh, 
the word is translated to, to describe uh, a person who has had uh, their genitalia removed by a person in power so that that so they could be their assistant without fear that they might spawn a new family line that would be, uh, you know, against them, okay? So it's super common and very, uh, very inhumane practice uh, around government offices, frankly. And all of you are going, eh, right now. Yes, that's the appropriate reaction. The point that Jesus is making, though, is, that it is the point with regard to marriage, okay? So, so the idea is that like, a, unit, a eunuch isn't going to marry, and a eunuch is not going to have sex, and unless you're going to enter the marriage covenant this way, then you will be like a eunuch. Now, many of you are like, that's, that's sexual ethic. That's very hard. I, I know. But let's take a minute and look at everything that our sexual ethic past the sexual revolution in 1969 has brought us. That's been super fun and easy, hasn't it? It's been super fun and easy to uh, watch poverty extend all the way to people uh, who are born without dads around because now they've been uh, free morally by society to just kind of have sex with whomever they want and abandon women. And then it's really fun for women to become pregnant uh, and not plan it and then feel the pressure to have an abortion and then live with, the th- with all of the results of having that abortion and then live trying and being single mom. Like that, that's been great for society and hasn't cost us millions of lives and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars except that it has. I don't mean to at all cast blame or make you feel guilty at all about that because that's the kind of family ethic I was reared in. We say to Jesus, well, your sexual ethic is challenging, and I think Jesus would say to us, well, ours isn't working. It isn't working. So, The gospel gives you hope for what family can be if you're single by understanding what the whole eunuch thing is. The the first uh, kind of eunuch that we're talking about is someone who was born that way. That is, people who are personally unable to do the family thing. Now, this can be uh, because uh, they are living with exclusive same-sex attraction or because perhaps they're intersex or because perhaps um, they are dealing with gender dysphoria or some other phenomenon or maybe just a ton of abuse that makes the idea of being married just impossible. And so the question is, well, what does the church say to people who are in that situation or one of those situations? And the answer is, well, we say what Jesus says. Jesus says this right here. This is a blessed state. It's hard. But it is a blessed state, and there is a place in the family of God, even for those who find natural family challenging or impossible. The second reason we can be encouraged by the words of our Lord Jesus is because some of us have come from a, uh, a broken family. And, and so the question has come, well, how, if, I, if I've already broken my family or I come from a broken family, how can I do this? And the answer is this, none of you are in God's family by birth. <laughs> Did you know that? None of you, not a one of you, was born into the kingdom of God. All of you, all of you have to be born again into the kingdom of God. And all of you, if you belong to God, if you call God your father, you are not part of his family because you had great parents. You're not part of his family because you're a great mom or dad. You're not part of his family because you're a great son or daughter. You're part of his family because he has adopted you. Which means the gracious goodness of our heavenly father has brought you in to a family bigger than you could possibly imagine, better than you've ever hoped, and more expansive with relationships that you have yet to mine the depths of. Oh, church, I find this so hard for us sometimes because we live in a big, lonely city where we, you know, we're all geographically quite close to one another, yet emotionally and spiritually so far apart. Well, I'm only here for three years. I won't build any long-term relationships. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not like them, and whatever them is that you've, you know, described the them as, as your mind, you, you give yourself an excuse to stay alienated from the people of God. And I'm here to tell you, no, there are mothers and fathers in the Lord. There are brothers and sisters in the Lord, and there are spiritual children you are meant to bring into the world. And that is, my friends, a kind of family that you can absolutely be a part of. A final way that the gospel gives us hope and renews and restores our vision of family is by understanding that the gospel actually empowers us to live this way. 
The gospel actually empowers us to have great families. The gospel is what keeps me married to my wife. The gospel is what keeps her married to me. The gospel is what keeps me faithful to my children. The gospel is what keeps the families in this house together. The gospel is the only thing I know to pull out and help a new couple that's coming into the covenant of marriage actually understand what marriage is going to be like and have the possibility of renewal and restoration so that they can walk it out, not just for five minutes or five years as they've got you know, the wedding butterflies, but for 50 years when cancer comes or when a child child falls far from the tree, or when the money is out, or when something challenging hits the shores of your life, you need something a little firmer than traditional family values to keep you together, because those, my friends, are built on a cultural thing. And we're not here to hold on to the cultural past or to progress towards some human exclusive vision of the cultural future. We are here to move onward to the culture of the kingdom, and the king made this thing called family to reflect his nature and his kingdom, but it's only possible, family is only possible by hope in the gospel of the kingdom. Therefore, marriage in the Christian context is a partnership for godliness and a context for raising godly children. It's an opportunity to walk in the faithfulness and goodness and beauty of our Savior. So, how do we do that? Well, if you're single... If you find yourself described in the sexual situation of a eunuch, what do you do? Well, you could leave and be really angry at me that I would dare hold you to what the scriptures say. And that's fine. You're probably transferring upon me, though, your frustration with God. And that frustration will probably follow you to any other church you go to. But you're free. You don't belong to me. So you could, you could reject these words, or you could refocus your passion. Because some of us who so desire to be married, desire to be married because it, we've created out of our future spouse and kids an idol. And the problem with doing that is that, A, you're miserable until you have them. B, if you get them, I promise you, you'll be miserable then. Because these little critters that you make with another person and the other person with whom you make them are terrible places from which to derive your meaning, your purpose, and your happiness. You'll be able to do it for a while. You might even be able to do it for a few years, but eventually the vampire fangs that you have stunk into your kids and your spouse will suck out their will to live, and you will have derived all of the pleasure that you could out of them, and their body will wear out, or their fun will wear out, or their money will wear out, and then your love for them will wear out. Promise. It's the story of my extended family. Just take my word for it. My wife and I have eight parents between us with 24 marriages between them. Let's just say I've seen that movie before. Refocus your passion. Because if, if we focus on the king and his kingdom, then all of a sudden, I can actually love my wife constantly, even if she's going through a tough moment. And she can love me, even as I go through my tough moments. And I'm not very nice to be around. And I can love my children, even when they're three. God, even when they're three. I can love them, right? I, I, can, I, I have something in order to give them, and that love can fill my home, my kitchen, my bedroom with meaning and longing to reflect and embody the meaning of the universe and the meaning of the king and his kingdom. We need to refocus our passion. Some of us, we need to repent of our worldliness. Some of us, we're trying to do family, and we're trying to aim for family, or we're holding out for family, but we're not holding out in any kind of way that looks like a Christian way. Like, oh no, we're going to do family. We're going to have great Christian family. We're just going to fornicate now like we're rabbits in heat. We're not going to fornicate. We're just going to live out every other antithetical ethic to the king and his kingdom. Oh, well, you know, we find uh, it's, it's really hard. I realize that for the last, you know, few thousand years, it must have been much easier to obey the scriptures with regard to its sexual ethic or its moral ethic or its whatever ethics. But right now we find it really hard, so we're not going to do it. When you do that, you are telling something about the king and his kingdom that is not true. It's like me preaching a false gospel to you. Because your lives, my friends, they're parables. My life is a parable. And the words we say and the things we tweet, they're great. But you know what's louder than all of that? Tuesday at 3.30 when you do something. Friday at 10 p.m. when you do something. Your life says something. And so for many of us, we, if you belong to Jesus in here, maybe you need to repent of worldliness because you've tried to somehow make your vision of family. You know, you're trying to have it all these ways. And what you end up with is a blasé mix of something that is meaningless to the world, not going to help anyone, and going to certainly not help you. Worldliness is not engaging. And finally, we need to remember the mission. 
Jesus Christ stepped into the world and stepped into this thing called family and became a part of it. I, I love that in our gospel, it's not the story of God kind of going, you know, out of heaven and saying, hey, everybody, this is the truth. You need to obey me or I'll put you under my boot. And then he goes up and throws down to us a marriage manual and a parenting manual. That's not what he did. Rather, he embodied actually kind of a messed up family. The family of David, hello? Just read your Old Testament. It's not good. And then was born as an unplanned pregnancy to a young teenage girl who lived in the backwoods without two cents to rub together. Sure, it was very inconvenient, very challenging. And yet he steps into this thing called family, not only because he wants to be the savior of the world, but he wants to be the one whose gospel renews what family can be. Family is created by God to reflect something of his kingdom. And the gospel of the kingdom is the only hope for your family. It's the only hope for your family. I love that my God doesn't look at my background and decide, oh, well, yeah, he's adoptable. My God looks at his family and says, I got to bring him in it. My God doesn't look at you. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't look at you and go, well, maybe she's, you know, I don't know if I can handle her. I don't know if I'm going to you know, bring him in or I don't know if I can do anything. Do you, do you realize that God, in the family of the Trinity, in sending his son, has invited all of you to become a part of his family? In this family, if you would, come. The adoption process is simply repentance and faith in his son, Jesus. And that means the church gets to be the living embodiment of this new family. We're creating, therefore, kingdom families that are a part of a bigger kingdom family. I know these words are tough sometimes, and I know that the concept of family is challenging. But we, I promise you, this, the gospel is big enough that we can walk it out together if we would. And so the invitation for you is to come to Jesus with all of your hopes, with all of your dreams, with all of your kids or lack thereof, with your spouse or your desire for one, with your body, and say, God, make me fit to live and reflect your kingship and your kingdom by faith in Jesus the King.